thank you, uh, Cheryl, and thank you, Melissa, and, uh, and thank you, Dean, and thanks everybody for showing up. I, I would have felt, I almost um, didn't get here today because we have bad weather in New York, and you know how that goes. <laughs> and I was flying on that airline that is an acronym for the words, doesn't ever leave the airport. And I'm getting feedback on my microphones. So I'm wearing two of them. Oh, not my microphones. OK. So um, rather than knock this computer over, we're going to hand that computer off. And then I'm going to stop using that microphone, because these microphones have to work. Are they working? Yeah. Testing one, two. OK, I think we got it now. So um, my plane got here, my plane left the airport a few hours late, and I was thinking maybe I'm going to have to postpone. And it's obviously really good that I didn't have to postpone because I'm sure they wouldn't have been able to call all of you. And you all, all shown up and found out that it was canceled, and you would all have been mad. You would have been mad at me, and you would have been mad at everybody. So now we're all good, nobody's mad. So, so that's, that's really good. Um, do we have a, a remote thing here or no? No remote. No remote. Okay. No, the first one is black. That's it. Okay. So, um, so we're going to we're going to start tonight by asking a question. This is the topic, and we're going to start tonight by asking a question that many of you have asked, and that is, does my dog really love me, or does she just? <laughs> want a treat. How many people have asked, does my dog really love me or does she just want a treat, right? Okay. <laughs> Probably the most common question asked about animals and their inner and emotional lives. Well, obviously, obviously our dogs really love us, obviously, and it's obvious that it's easy to see what's going on in their heads. It's easy to see, right? Easy to see. You always, <laughs> you always, <laughs> always know. Well, what is going on in those furry little heads? Something's going on. <laughs> but why is the question, do they love us? Why is our question always about us? Why are we such narcissists that the only thing we want to know about them is about us? So I needed a different question. And here it is. Who are you? Who are you is a very different question than do you love me? There are capacities of the human mind, but are these capacities only of the human mind? What's going on in all these other really big brains that share the world with us? Is there any way to possibly really ask that question? And quite a few scientists have answered no. There's no way to ask that question. But I think that there are some very good ways to ask that question. You can look at their brains. You can think about and study evolution. And you can simply watch what they're doing. So now, the first neurons, the first nervous system, evolved in jellyfish. And then jellyfish gave rise eventually to chordates, and chordates gave rise to vertebrates. Vertebrates came out of the sea, and here we all are. But it's still true that a nerve cell looks the same whether it is in a crayfish or a bird or a human being. A nerve cell is basically a nerve cell in a crayfish, a bird, or a human being. So what does this tell us about the mental experiences of crayfish? Does it tell us anything? Well, it turns out that if you give a crayfish 
a lot of little tiny electric shocks, every time it tries to come out of its burrow and look for food, it will develop what appears to be anxiety disorder. It will act like it's afraid to come out. Is that the correct interpretation? Let's do an experiment. Give the crayfish exactly the same drug used to treat anxiety disorder in humans, and guess what happens? They relax, they come out, and they start exploring. <laughs> How do we relate to the potential for anxiety in crayfish? Mostly we boil them. <laughs> I can see this is a rough group. I, <laughs> not a lot of compassion in that response. Octopuses use tools as well as most apes, and they recognize different human faces. How do we celebrate the ape-like intelligence of octopuses? Wait for it. Mostly boiled. When a grouper chases a small fish into a crevice, the grouper sometimes goes to where it knows a moray eel is sleeping, and it has a way to signal to the moray eel, follow me, and the moray understands that signal and often follows. The grouper then will say, the fish is right there. The moray will go in. Sometimes the moray will get the hiding fish. Sometimes the hiding fish will bolt, and the grouper will get it. This is an ancient partnership that's probably been going on for millions of years. And we've only known about it for about 15 years. And when I say we, I mean the 17 people who read that paper. <laughs> How do we celebrate this extremely incredible interspecies partnership, interspecies hunting partnership? Like, who has that? People and groupers. How do we celebrate that? Mostly fried. <laughs> a pattern is emerging, and it says a lot more about our minds than it's telling us about theirs. Sea otters use tools, and sea otters take time away from what they're doing to teach their children how to do things. Very few animals teach. Chimpanzees do not teach. Sea otters teach. Killer whales do a lot of teaching, and they share almost all their food. The human mind comes to us through the long sweep of evolution. And the way evolution works is before it fabricates something new, it uses parts that are already in stock on the shelf. And then it fabricates a new twist. So you see a mouse brain. The human brain is basically the same thing, but quite elaborated from the mouse brain. And then you see a chimpanzee brain and a human brain, basically we have a very big chimpanzee brain. And it's a good thing ours is big because we are also the most insecure animal on the planet. But, uh-oh, there's a dolphin. What is a dolphin doing with a huge brain, with a much bigger forebrain, and many more convolutions. Okay, well, maybe you say, well, okay, I see brains, so what? So what? You can just see brains. That's not a mind. But I think you can see the workings of the mind in the logic of behaviors. What do we see about the logic of this behavior? Does anybody think the big elephants just stomped the little elephants to death? <laughs> no. No, we make sense of that scene exactly as the elephants make sense of that scene. They have found shade under the palms. 
because it's cooler and more comfortable there. They've let their babies go to sleep. And while they rest, they remain vigilant, relaxed, but not quite asleep, all facing different directions and all touching. That scene makes perfect sense to us because that's exactly what they're doing and why they are doing it. Under the same sun, in the same planes, listening to the whoops and roars of the same dangers, we became who we are, and that's how they became who they are, and we've been neighbors for a very, very long time. Nobody would mistake these elephants as being relaxed. They're obviously concerned about something. What are they concerned about? Well, it turns out that if you record voices of people, and you record the voices of tourists, and you play that through a speaker hidden in the bushes, and you record the voices of herders who carry spears and often get into confrontations with elephants at water holes, the elephants who hear the tourists don't do anything because tourists don't bother elephants. The elephants who suddenly hear the voices of herders bunch up together and run away. Not only do they understand that there are certain kinds of animals and there are humans, they understand that there are different kinds of humans and some are dangerous and some aren't. They've been watching us a lot longer and a lot more carefully than we have been watching them. We all have basically the same imperatives. Keep our babies alive, find food, and try to survive. And we have the same skeletons, we have the same organs, our nervous systems are arranged the same way, and we are kin under the skin, whether we're outfitted for hiking or for diving. We're all basically the same, with the same skeletons, the same organs, and the same nervous system. And we see helping where help is needed, and we see curiosity, mainly in the young. We see the deep bonds of family relation. We recognize courtship when we see it. Dancing is dancing. And in the midst of all of this, out of the sweep of continuous time and all of these samenesses, we say, yeah, but are they even conscious? This strikes me as a very strange ball of confusion. Now, we can be here on Earth with these creatures and wonder if anything at all is happening in their mind and whether they have any experience of life at all. And that is a big question that people still ask. Now, when you get general anesthesia, you become unconscious. Your senses stop being connected to your sensation. You have no sensation of the world. That's what consciousness is. It means you are getting input from your senses that you are having a mental experience of. And to look at creatures that have eyes to see, ears to hear, noses to smell, who run around and play and interact with each other, and then say, is anything going on in their heads, strikes me as an incredible dysfunction of our own minds. I don't know how else to really think of it. And some people say, OK, well, maybe they know what's going on, but there are some very special things about people. One of the special things about people is empathy. Only people have empathy, so it is often said. Well, empathy is simply the ability of a mind to match the mood of your companions. So if you see somebody who is sad, it brings your mood down. You walk into a room, everybody's happy, it brings your mood up. Somebody is suddenly alarmed and startled, you are alarmed and startled. Empathy happens to be about the only possible way that any animals that live together could possibly live together in a coordinated way. If your companions are hurrying, 
you better hurry up or you will be left behind. That is empathy. The oldest form of empathy is contagious fear. If the people you are with suddenly startle and run away, it does not pay for you to say, gee, I wonder why everybody just left. <laughs> because that will be selected out. So like everything in life, empathy is on a sliding scale. There's what I call basic empathy, which is mood matching. Then there's what I call sympathy, which is a little bit more removed. You say, I'm sorry to hear that your grandmother just passed away. You don't feel it the same way, but you understand that it means something to somebody else. I call that sympathy. And then if you are moved to act and do something based on your ability to match moods and to sympathize, that I call compassion. And it's all on a sliding scale. Human empathy, far from the thing that makes us human, is far from perfect. We round up empathic animals, and we kill them, and we eat them. And maybe you're saying, OK, look, that's not fair, because you're using dogs. We all like dogs in America. And you're saying, oh, Chinese people eat dogs. And this is just they're different species. That's just predation. And we are predators. And that is not a fair test of human empathy. But we don't treat each other too well either. And I hardly need to bring any example up for the inhumanity of people toward people. Yet, if people know one thing about animal behavior, they seem to know this one very awkward technical word, anthropomorphism. And they seem to know that you must never attribute human thoughts and emotions to non-human beings. And why is this so easy for us to believe? because it reinforces our favorite story, which is we are completely special and there's nothing in the world like us. And because if they can't think and feel, we don't ever have to worry about what they think and feel. So it's easy for us to believe that. But I'm here to tell you I think that's silly. And I'm also here to tell you that it is not scientific to say that they're hungry when they are eating and they're tired when their tongues are hanging out, but when they're playing with their family to say we have no way of knowing what they could possibly be experiencing. They, well, how could we possibly know if an elephant could be happy or feel joy? That's like saying how could we possibly know that a lion could be hungry or a dog can be tired? So a reporter said to me, OK, OK, you're telling me all this stuff, but how do you really know that other animals can think and feel? And I thought, well, I had just had my book had just gotten published and thought of all the hundreds of science references in the back and what was going to be the best study I could think of to prove it. And then I realized the answer was right there on the rug. Because when my puppy comes off of the rug and she comes over to me and she rolls over on her back, which by the way, she never comes off the rug and goes over to a chair and rolls over on her back. <laughs> she comes over to me. And what does that show? It shows that she has just had the thought. And the thought is, I would like my belly rubbed. <laughs> and I know that we are family. I know him. We're family. And I know that I can go, and if I roll over, he'll know exactly what I'm asking for, and he'll get the job done, and it will feel good. And she has thought, and she has felt, and it's not a lot more complicated than that. But we normally don't know animals individually. Normally we say, oh, that's an elephant. Oh, those are killer whales. Oh, those are wolves. That's not how they experience life. That tall, thinned male, he's part of the L-pod. He's 38 years old. And the female next to him is also part of the L-pod. And she's 44. And they have known each other for decades. They are close friends and family members. 
They know exactly who they are. They know what they sound like in the ocean. <laughs> they can find each other when they're separated by miles, and they've been doing it for years and years. They are individuals, and they have a life. This is an elephant. His name is Philo. And that's him four days later. <coughs> Humans not only are capable of experiencing grief, we are capable of generating an incredible amount of it. We want to carve their teeth. Why can't we wait for them to die? In Roman times, elephants lived from the shores of the Mediterranean to the Cape of Good Hope. And except for the worst part of the Sahara, they were everywhere. In the 1980s, they still had big strongholds in Central and East Africa. Now their populations are broken into tiny shards and slivers. This is the geography of the grandest animal on land being driven completely extinct. We do much better in our own country, where park rangers killed the last wolves in Yellowstone. And then 60 years later, when the elk had gotten completely out of control, after decades of fighting with ranchers in Congress, they brought wolves back to Yellowstone to try to retain or to restore something like the natural balance there. And then people started to come to see the wolves. People actually spend $30 million a year going to Yellowstone primarily to see wolves. Those are the people who say on the questionnaire, I came to see the wolves. And Yellowstone is the best place in the world to see free living wolves. And in one particular valley was the most stable family of wolves, the most viewed, the best known. And a wolf pack is a family. It's the breeding male and female, the mother and father, and they're young from two or three years. And as the young become adolescents, they leave to try to get their own foothold in life and take charge of their lives. They live in a nuclear family that is structured basically exactly like ours. A couple of years ago, because of pressure from ranchers and other people in Wyoming, Congress took the wolves off the Endangered Species Act, and one day, in winter, when all the, most of the elk had left for lower, lower elevations, most of the deer had left for lower elevations, the wolves got near the boundary of the park. And no wolves answered them. And they didn't know why no wolves answered them. So they went out to where most of the prey went. And almost immediately, the lead female, the mother, and an, and an adult male who was the uncle, not the breeding adult, because that was an unusual pack with two adult males in it, they were both shot because Congress had taken the wolves off the Endangered Species Act, and the border to Yellowstone is an imaginary line. So instantly, the family started to spiral down into sibling rivalry, that one who was upside down, she was the most precocious wolf of the young ones in that pack. And two new males came in as the adults were shot out. The adult male fled. Uh, his children started fighting. Two new males came in. Her sisters couldn't take it that she was getting most of the attention. And they drove her out. And it seems that they drove her out because they were jealous of her. If you have dogs who are descended from wolves, you know that they are capable of being jealous at times, and it seemed that they drove her out just because they were jealous. I watched that happen myself. She spent days trying to get back in, and her sisters would not let her in to her family. The family was falling apart because the mother had gotten shot, the uncle had gotten shot, and the adult male had fled, basically probably trying to find his mate and his brother, and then when the two new males came in, he couldn't come back. 
Going into winter, he lost his family. That means his hunting support. That means his territory where he could hunt. He lost everything. And I would have said that is a sure, sure bet that within a couple of months, he's going to be dead. But she left the park and got killed at somebody's chicken coop because she was starving. And he managed to survive. And after two years of wandering around trying to find a place where he could fit without getting attacked, he found a mate, he found a place, and he had pups this past year for the first time. And the point of all of that is they have lives. Their lives have a trajectory, and the trajectory can change depending on something sudden and unexpected that happens to them just like us. We hurt them an awful lot. And a question is, why don't they hurt us more? Why is it that no human being has ever been hurt by a free-living killer whale? That whale had just finished tearing to pieces a gray whale that he and his companions had killed, and yet those people in the boat had nothing to fear. I watched this one. He's T20. He's very well known. I watched him tear a seal into three pieces with two of his family members, and those people in the boat had nothing to fear. They eat seals. Why don't they eat us? Why can we trust them around our toddlers? Why is it that in two separate cases, in two separate countries with two separate researchers, Researchers that became lost in fog while they were following killer whales that were acting elusive suddenly found that the whales came back to them and that when they decided to just follow the whales, they went in one case at 15 miles before the fog suddenly parted and the researcher's house was right there on the shoreline and then the whales left. Why is that? In the Bahamas, there's a researcher named Denise Hersing. She knows her dolphins just like the wolf researchers know the individual wolves and the elephant people know the individual elephants and they know whose baby is who and they know some of the history of their lives. She went to see her dolphins as she has done every year for about 30 years and instead of them all coming over and recognizing her and playing in the bow and greeting them as they always do, they were weirdly skittish, and they wouldn't come near the boat. And while they were trying to figure out why the dolphins that they knew so well and recognized individually wouldn't come near the boat, somebody came out on deck and announced that one of the people had died in a nap during a nap in his bunk, had just died. Now, how could the dolphins know that one of the human hearts had stopped. And why would they care? And why would it spook them? No one knows the answers to those questions, but almost nobody knows any of this stuff. And what it really shows is that there is a lot going on in the other minds that we are with on this planet that our minds basically never give a thought about at all. In an aquarium in South Africa, there was a baby bottlenose dolphin, and her name was Dolly. And one day, and she was really young. She was still nursing. She was a baby. And one day, one of the keepers was on a cigarette break, and he was outside the pool looking through the glass window, and he was smoking, just watching the dolphins. And Dolly, the infant, came over and looked at him for a few moments, and then just swam back to her mother, and she nursed for a few moments, and then she swam back to the window, and she released a cloud of milk that enveloped her head <laughs> like his cigarette smoke. <laughs> Somehow, a baby dolphin got the idea, I'm going to use milk to represent that stuff that's around his head. And when we use one thing to represent something else, we call that art. 
The things that make us human are not the things that we keep telling ourselves are the things that make us human. It's not empathy and it's not self-recognition and these nice self-congratulatory things. The thing that makes us human seems to me to be that we are the most extreme animal. We are the most compassionate and the cruelest. We are the most creative and by far the most destructive animal that has ever been on this planet. And we are all of those things together at the same time. But love is not unique to people and it is not the thing that makes us human. We are not the only ones who love our mates or who love our children. Albatrosses spend an incredible amount of energy raising their chicks. They often fly six to 10,000 miles over a period of two or three weeks to bring back one meal for their chick who is waiting in the nest. They nest in the most remote island groups in the biggest oceans of the world, and often in those island groups they nest only on the remote outer islands and here's what it looks like on the remotest islands in the world. We don't know anything about them, but boy, they sure know about us. And when they come back from flying for six to 10,000 miles for three weeks or so to deliver food, often what they bring back is plastic. And all of those chicks, all of those chicks have plastic in them. Now this is literally the chain of being. One generation has to pass life to the next generation, and if that breaks, it all ends. This albatross was ready to fledge and died at age six months or so, and was packed with red cigarette lighters. This is not the relationship we are supposed to have with the rest of the world. But we who have named ourselves after our wisdom never seem to think about the consequences of our actions. And yet, when we welcome new human life into the world, we paint animals <coughs> on the nursery room walls. We don't paint cell phones or work cubicles. We don't paint restaurants or sidewalk scenes, we paint animals. Because without even thinking about it, our subconscious wish is to say, welcome into a world where we have company. We are not alone. And yet every animal in every depiction of Noah's Ark deemed worthy of salvation. And remember, in that story, the creator wanted to save one righteous human family, but every animal. And yet every animal in that depiction, and in all the depictions that you see, they're all in mortal danger now. And their flood is us. So we started with a question. Do they love us? And we're going to end by turning that question around and asking, do our minds have the capacity to love them enough to simply let them continue to be with us on Earth? Are we capable of that? <laughs> Thank you very much.